What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the quarantine zone again. And this time we got Per Weaver. Thank you so much for being here today, man. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So your new uh, solo album, which is All Is Well in the, Le- in the Land of the Living, but for the rest of us, Lights Out. I know artists really don't particularly like this type of question, but this is a really interesting statement. And I like how, you know, the the album has like, you know, the segments of the album title for the song titles is there a specific meaning for this particular solo album as opposed to what we heard in head without eyes in a way the initial idea was to to write one long song and uh, to me i guess i when i listen to it i i listen to it as one long song and but i you know it's easier to sort of divide it into different parts or songs <laughs> yeah. if you if you want you know and so and then i thought i would try to be a little bit clever and use the different song titles in in, in a sentence so because i think it's it, it it's a pretty it's like a little journey to listen to it from the start to the end and uh, it makes sense to to use the song titles as the EP title as well, I guess. Yeah, right. definitely. I mean, having one long song definitely sort of works in the favor with that because I, I do look at it as a similar, uh, in a way, to albums such as Winter Gates by Insomnium or uh, Bell Witch's Mirror Reaper in a way. It kind of continues in a similar vein. Sorry about the construction that's happening in the background. No worries. Yeah. Um, it's cool. Yeah. But um, did, was this continuing in a similar vein of the uh, last album you did, Head Without Eyes, or were you experimenting a little bit further for this particular album and kind of taking a new approach? Um, it's it's more or less a con- continuation, I'd say. Um, <clears throat> the lyrics for this new EP is, is just um, built on a track from the first album. There's a song on the first album that's called anywhere the blood flows so and that was the main inspiration for this ep so i just wrote more lyrics on based on the same kind of story mm-hmm. and uh, so lyrically it's definitely a continuation of the first album uh, musically yes um, but i tried some new things that i didn't do on the first one uh, which was interesting and 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 fun and a little bit of a learning experience because i'm i haven't written music um in that way before there's a there's a track called but for the rest of us it's the third one or the first one if you're into vinyl on side two um that that was that was um I just set a, a timer for six minutes and, and did a piano improvisation. And I said, told myself that I was not going to edit anything, just leave it like it is. So I did a piano improv for six minutes and then I arranged everything afterwards to, to, or adjust the, every, every, everything afterwards to, to go with the improv, so to speak. I've, and I've never done it like that before. So that was kind of interesting. So I'm, I myself too, I'm a piano player and, and I love doing that improvisational stuff. Do you work where you like in the left hand, you pick like a key in a way or like a chord progression and you kind of let the right hand go a uh, more like a liberating and experiment with a lot of notes because with the improv, you know, there is sort of like the aspect where certain notes have to fit with certain uh, steps or certain uh, chord progressions. So like, did you pick a key that you wanted that improvisational aspect to start in first? No, but it, I did not actually, but it happened that way because then I added, you know, like the droney stuff underneath it and, and that sort of makes it uh, a key. So, but I, I totally know what you mean. Sometimes um, it's, it's easier if you have like a root note, even, even if you try to steer away from it and just... Uh, you know, go totally free form. Uh, being a rock musician, I guess it's it's always easy to have some kind of uh, 
root note or like at least you tell yourself that okay so we're doing d minor here <laughs> yeah so, but but um i try to that's one of the things that i i think that's it depends on where your head's at really um um, I've, I've worked a lot the last years trying to be become a little bit more free as a musician. Yeah. So this was a little bit of an experiment that track. Yeah, and you know the root note thing. I mean, it works great because, like, uh, I remember uh, when you play, like, uh, for instance, where the root note is like C sharp. If you bring a B note in there, it, it's like the most unbearable. Like that, the way it just because I've always said the key of C sharp is one of the most beautiful, like, sad notes ever. But you bring yeah. <laughs> you bring that B in there. You accidentally hit that B. It just shatters all harmony to it. So that's a really <laughs> bold move to be able to record something improvisational and stick with it in one. There, it wasn't done in like multiple takes or anything like that. I did uh, I did three different takes, but I didn't you know edit and cut them up or anything. I just listened. I did three in a row, and then I listened to them and. This is going to be the one that I choose for this. Okay. Um, and as for the other two, though, is there a chance we could hear those in the future uh, on a future offering? Maybe they're already erased. Oh, come on! <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, when I record stuff, I a lot of times, uh, you know, when you record in a studio or you have an, you know, an engineer a good engineer and you don't you don't have to think about recording yourself it's more about playing and and they keep takes different takes of stuff like solos or parts or riffs or whatever and 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 then when everyone's happy you end up with five or six different takes and then you have to choose takes i hate that it's yeah. like i try to go with a gut feeling if i'm happy with something i just erase the other stuff Okay. You ever worried that like the stuff you erase could could have potentially been a B side one day to just be the biggest hit you've ever made? What if that was a hit song that you erased? <laughs> then I the only one I got to blame is myself, I guess. So fair enough. And hey, that that's a very humble thing for any artist to say. So um but um being that like, you know, you kind of have like a story going from Head Without Eyes to All Is Well in the Land of the Living. Like, do you recommend that a listener were to really start off with, like in order to get the full context of the story, a listener would start off with Head Without Eyes and then move on to All Is Well in the Land of the Living? Like, do you, do you almost look at these albums like Lord of the Rings or The Terminator where like they need to follow the first one to get the story of the second one? For me, they definitely like that. But I would hope that you could enjoy them separate but if you would ask me being you know like a, a super nerd i i if someone did uh, something like two albums that were a little bit connected i want to know about it and and i would definitely try and listen to them you know next to each other but i think that uh, I, or at least i hope that for those who haven't heard the first one they could listen to this one without any problems and, and hopefully enjoy it, you know, so. Yeah. For this concept that you're exploring, is this rooted in like a personal experience of yours or is there kind of like a existential research that's involved with the making of your solo work, like kind of like uh, looking outwards for this inspiration? It's <clears throat> the reason why I started doing stuff under my own name instead of sort of hide behind a, a band name was uh it was i guess it was because i wanted to explore a lot of influences and music that have inspired me through the years but <clears throat> maybe i haven't they haven't been um, that prominent in in the bands and projects that i've been involved in so to speak so so this was more more like an when I started, it was more like, um, what would you call it, a homage to, to all the influences and stuff that I've been listening to my whole life, but maybe haven't had the time or chance to explore with any of the projects and bands I've been part of. And so it was more like a muse, music adventure to start with than, than a, a lyrical adventure. Uh, those came afterwards. Okay. And uh, so, yeah. yeah. Do you, so it's fair to say that your music is very open to interpretation. It's not like you're trying to engage the listener in a story as much as 
really you're mainly focused on the music, right? Yeah, I mean, I, it takes forever for me to write lyrics, um, mostly because I'm lazy when it comes to writing lyrics, but also because <clears throat> English is obviously not my first language. So sometimes that could be, you know, a little bit of an obstacle to get past when you write lyrics. Um, even in a weird way, it feels more natural to write a, a lyric in English than in Swedish, uh, because I think the majority of music that I've listened to my whole life is is in English, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's really weird when you translate uh, lyrics. So one of my favorite uh, bands sings predominantly in Swedish, uh, the black metal band Life Lover, and their music, when translated, it actually works very well, but it would not work if you sang it in English over the music. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, like, uh, I'm not talking crap by any means because I love this band, but Rammstein, my mom is from Germany, and she actually translated yeah. the lyrics for me, and the lyrics in English are just not good. They're just so much more powerful and so much more meaning when you just don't understand them. Yeah, well, since German and Swedish are fairly similar, in in, in a somewhat similar at least, uh, I, I kind of know what Rammstein is singing about. Yeah. But I think it... In for a band like that, what they're doing, I think German is probably the perfect language. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another band uh, from Japan, Durin Gray, they sing in only Japanese, and their yeah. music is just beautiful to listen to. So yeah, yep. Now, in order to like get in that songwriting mood, to get that inspiration, does inspiration just come when you least expect it, or do you almost have like a usual realm? like a studio or a usual space where maybe the ideas flow? I try to play an instrument each day, you know, just noodling basically. And, and in the majority, like 90% of those occasions would be me sitting with a guitar on the couch and, and just playing. Um, and sometimes, stuff happens, you know, and I record it on the phone as soon as I can and, and just leave it there uh, until I go to the rehearsal room and, and listen th through what I listen to what I got and, and see if there's anything that I still, you know, get inspired by to continue to work on. So most of the stuff that I do is just with the guitar on the couch. Okay. And, uh, and I think it doesn't matter if it doesn't mean that I sit there for eight or nine hours a day. If, if I can just play, you know, 30 minutes, an hour a day, that's, that's fine because they, it gets creativity flowing. I think. Yeah. You, you don't, you don't like uh become there. There is such a thing as uh being uh, enslaved to passion in a way where sometimes you, you really feel like you're forcing something out or you're only, creating something for the sake of fulfillment and so and that i feel like when you just let it flow without any interruption i think that's really when you get the ultimate best product it's very easy to tell when something is forced and when something isn't yeah i think so too um it's also i i do this continuously so it's i've never been short of ideas either it it's it's not i'm not you know i don't get up in the morning and you know, sit there and think, I have to write a song today. It's not, it's not like that at all. Uh, but I tend to come up with things um, all the time, just small things. And, and sometimes they lead into sometimes a whole song and sometimes just a, a quick short section or whatever. But I do this every day and I've done it for, I don't know, 35 years. So there's this, always something lying around in the, on the phone these days and before it was on a cassette you know so yeah that, that was before my time i was born in 93 <laughs> so yeah but um between your solo work and you know spiritual beggars and the work you've done with opeth and so many other uh bands switchblade you name it like is there a different mind frame that goes into what every project that you're in or is there a usual method behind the madness that applies to everything that you do 
I don't know. I think it's. I played with lots of different things, and I think, um, I think it's important for me to, to sort of have the mind frame that the project demands, so to speak. I think it's important to, to know what style you're you're playing. Even I mean, even if both Spiritual Vegas Opus and Switchblade as well are some kind of heavy heavy music, you know, <clears throat> it's they're very different. And 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 you have there there are different qualities to the music and it's important to to sort of focus on what the band is all about when you do it, I think. Yeah. So I don't know if if, if there's like a particular thing or frame of mind that I have it's just I mean it's easy if you love music it's easy to get into it that's I've never thought too much about those things to be honest um, so if you've been so, approached by a project it, it does it doesn't take like a it, it's just the love of music that puts it all into your work like it's not like you're like a specialist or be like okay well this isn't metal enough for me to work on so I can't do this or this isn't uh melodic enough for me so I can't do this you you just t you, you embrace challenge in a way right for the love of music yeah definitely I, um I listen to so much different music I always have uh, so I think that would probably be my strength as a musician that I understand different types of music pretty good and pretty quick as well. I'm by no means, you know, a, a, an advanced technical player or anything like that. But I do think I got a good grip on <clears throat> styles, different genres as, uh, and, and what, what fits the music, so to speak. Yeah. You don't have any background in theory at all? No, I can't read music. No. Okay. But I'd imagine you know what key you're in, right? Going back to the root note discussion that we yeah, had. Yeah, yeah. Those those are things that you learn along the way. I mean, when when I was a kid or a teenager and started playing in bands, you had names for for chords. You know, it's like if someone would have said E thirteen minus eleven or whatever, I wouldn't have known what that was all about. But if someone said, "Can you play the Hendrix chord?" Yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> or I you know it's like they need to make a music book of like all the different names for different chords so yeah um so it's the same there and like voivod that was like the first band in my teens that used the tritone thing in 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 chords and used it heavily not just as a uh, what would you call it just just like a, a little uh, spice here and there, but he used it a lot in, in all of his riffing. And I love that. But, you know, that became the Black Sabbath notes or the Black Sabbath chord or Voivod chord. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's actually a uh, real fascinating too, because uh, I, I think that the Black Sabbath, they kind of came up with those notes out of sheer necessity because of Tony Iommi's injury and stuff. Yeah. So it, it's it's always like interesting on how like, different ideas like a lot of people say that everything in music has been done before and sure i think it is getting a little bit harder and harder to innovate in a way or invent something new but there is no doubt that um with uh there's always going to be some innovation i think all the greatest forms of music were formed by accident to be honest yeah i don't think it um <clears throat> yeah i agree i don't think it as it it is as thought through as some people might believe a lot of times uh, uh, and also yeah you can always argue i guess that everything has been done or whatever but if you let your persona shine through it's always going to sound different than the next guy yeah well like, do you do you almost look at like every album that you're done whether it is like the work that you've done with spiritual beggars or like even your solo work is it almost kind of isn't everything you do just basically a representation of who you personally are at that particular time you look at the stuff as a self-portrait yes um but i i've also been very lucky that in the bands and all the stuff that i've done people have always uh, sort of uh endorsed uh, the musician's individuality um, 
and that goes for everyone in, in the bands. It's there's never there's never been how would you say like a, you have to do this like a forced try to emulate something that you're not. It's it's always been a very free musical environment, even though you work within a certain frame, like, you know, progressive rock or 70s rock or metal or whatever it is. But it's always, I think I've been fortunate to, to work with people that have a very good understanding of, you know, that if the individual shines through, it'll sound better, you know. Definitely. You ready for the most difficult question of the whole interview? <laughs> sure, go for it. How do you know when a song is done? Uh, when I when I have the vinyl or the CD in my hands. Oh come on! <laughs> <laughs> that's all, that's all you got. That's all I got. No, I don't know. I think. Um, Maybe others would disagree, but I would like to think that I'm pretty good at knowing when a song is done. Um, that it's it's just a feeling that you get. This is this is cool now. Don't don't mess with it, so to speak. Um, um, it's a difficult question, actually. It is when when I started to think about it, yeah. but. I think it, it it depends on what kind of ambition you have when you write the song. Yeah. A lot of I think it, it goes for most bands and and artists that like a lot of people say and, and I do too that it it the record didn't sound anything like I thought it would, you know, when I started doing this or whatever. Um, because things happen when you when you work along the line, um, but and there's there are very few songs that I've been part of or have written that would sound exactly like I would imagine them to sound like when you when you start out, mm -hmm. and uh, I think this track that the new EP is based upon anyway the blood flows from the first album that's one of the very few that it came out as I expected it to do <laughs> it's just which is very weird I think uh, and so that one I knew when it was done okay well like you know I'd, I can I can only imagine this could probably go for every album you've ever made too like it when you don't revolve things too much on around a preconceived idea, right? We, we're going back to the improvisational uh, piano thing. Like you don't go into it yeah. with too much. It has to be this, or it has to be this. You kind of like let the songs develop on their own and you kind of act as its humble guide in a way. Yeah. I think even if you have like a set song structure, when you start to record something, um, or at least uh, for me, it's like maybe I have a piano part or a bass line or a guitar part or something that is that is the foundation for the song. And you know exactly what that's going to be for, for and, and the length of the song, basically. But the things that you add on top of it, there's anything could happen, really, I think. And it does as well, because what you might think is a brilliant idea when you think about it and then you start to play it over the the other stuff it just sounds like crap oh yeah many times yep. and and then you have to adjust music is a lot like comedy in a way what you think is going to be funny it, as you're looking at yourself in the mirror and then you bring it to the <laughs> yeah, audience yeah. and then you just hear crickets the whole time like there's so <laughs> yeah, many exactly. ways to, it, it, the other thing is, is that it's not just the songwriting, but it's the it's the way that both the artist and the audience experiences it as well. That adds a whole new layer of it. Like, um, I, I I know there's been a lot of great hits that existed that the artists hated them. Like, yeah, yeah, like, and they were only there because they needed to have this many songs on the album, or they like. It, it really, it's just songs. I think you understand the full meaning of a song or get the best representation of it when it results in a creative experience that is shared with individuals. Yeah, a couple of the the biggest heavy rock 
hits ever like Paranoid and Smoke on the Water, those were songs that were added last on the albums, I think. And just, you know, like a last minute jam just to sort of fill out the, the album. Yeah. So you never know. And that's honestly what keeps making art so exciting too, is that you just never know what the results are going to be. Yeah, which is cool as well, because those songs are good songs as well, even though maybe you would imagine that, like, if those two songs would be the examples, you could imagine that Sabbath, they worked a little bit more on Fairies Wear Boots, maybe from the same album, or in Purple, worked a little bit more on the song Highway Star, compared yeah. to what they did on yeah. Smoke on the Water and Paranoid. Yeah. And it's also um, it's also a matter of time. As somebody who goes to a heavy metal bar every week, I could go the rest of my life without hearing Walk by Pantera or Smoke on the Water yeah. or, <laughs> or you know, great we songs. Heard those. Yeah, great yeah, songs. Exactly. Great songs, but I can I can officially say like I'm 27 and I can officially say that I could go the rest of my life without hearing that song. Yeah, it's especially in the US I'd say uh, Walk has been that's been played in, I think, every bar I've been to in the U.S. when I've been there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it, and mm -hmm. uh, and as somebody who's worked in guitar stores, we have what we call the five S's of death, the five guitar solos you can't play at all anymore. Stairway to Heaven. Stairway to Heaven. Yep. Sweet Child of Mine. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, of course. Smells like Teen Spirit. <laughs> Smoke okay. on the Water. And Sweet oh, Home that one I knew. Yep, and Sweet Home Alabama. Those are the five that you cannot play anymore. <laughs> and anybody who's worked at a guitar uh, store will totally agree with me on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. No, that's fine. Yep. <laughs> and uh, before we go, I want to, A, thank you so much for your uh, time today and for such a great discussion. Again, sorry for the war zone that's outside my work office right now. Um, uh, I don't know. Oh, if, that's cool. Yeah, I don't know if they're building something or destroying something. I really can't tell. But uh, is uh, is there just anything else with the release of All Is Well in the Land of the Living but for the rest of us lights out that you would like uh, to promote? Like, uh, obviously, thanks to a certain virus that shall not be named, obviously, uh, shows aren't happening at the moment. But could you please bring this material on the road one day? That's the ambition. And uh, I've uh, started uh, rehearsing stuff with friends here in Stockholm for the... Uh, like quite recently actually and uh, uh the ambition is absolutely to to play live and uh, i've always enjoyed touring the states so playing the states and, and playing my own music would be amazing yeah. i don't know hopefully one day you know so yeah. we would love to have you here we're doing outdoor shows in the parks now so uh like yeah, uh, i've seen that yeah. online oh you did <laughs> i saw the mad ball mad ball clip <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was uh, insane. That was uh, n needless to say, uh, there won't be shows there anytime soon anymore. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that that was uh, strange. I'm surprised nobody died. But uh, thank you so much, everybody. Well, thank you. We are here with Per Weiberg. Be sure to check out All Is Well in the Land of the Living. But for the rest of us, lights out. This is Alex from Heavy New York.